There are some people who tell you there is nothing more beautiful or majestic than witnessing a sunrise in person. I am not one of those people because I still want to be asleep. I have never had any desire whatsoever to wake up and watch the sunrise. I just never have. And for those of you who love that sort of thing, I'm glad you found something that, that you love. But for the rest of us, let us sleep, all right? So when it was 4.14 a.m. one morning, and all of a sudden I heard incessant barking through my condo walls, I suddenly remembered that my neighbor had gotten a new puppy the day before. That dog barked from 4.14 in the morning until I left for work and didn't stop. The next morning, we made it to 4.16. Dog learned to sleep in for two minutes. After that morning, I, I went over to my neighbor and I said, is there any way we, we can do something about this? And she said, don't worry. The dog's going to be going to obedience school next week. <laughs> Great. The third morning, honestly, I didn't wake up because I think once your body reaches the point of exhaustion, like you just, you can tune certain things out. But the fourth morning, I was back up at 4.30 listening to the dog bark through the walls. That stupid dog went to obedience school, and that stupid dog never did shut up. It barked every single morning. It was the most annoying thing I think I have ever heard. It wasn't just like a bark. It was one of those little yippy dogs, you know, probably about 20 pounds at, at when, once it's grown to its fullness. Basically a glorified cat that just barks. That's what this dog was. And I swear to you, I can't prove it, but I swear to you, that stupid dog put its mouth up right against the wall in between our two condos just to drive me crazy. You ever been there when something's really loud and you don't want it to be? You ever been there when you, you're trying to have the barbecue and your neighbor decides, oh, there's 30 cars on the block. Now's a great time to mow the grass. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, what is going on? You can't get anything else out of your mind. It drives you absolutely crazy. And this morning, as we wrap up our series on the church that we've entitled The Bride, I want to ask a question of us. My question is very simply this. What if we're being looked at as that annoying dog? As that lawnmower? As that noise that is the most grating and annoying thing that people encounter and people hear. Is that true of us? 1 Corinthians 13, which you can follow along on your phones or your tablets in the Bible app if you brought your Bibles there, and if not, it'll be on the screens, is, is what we're going to be looking at this morning. This was written by a guy named Paul, and it was written to a church, a very early church in a town called Corinth. Hence the name 1 Corinthians. And they had so many issues that he had to write them a couple letters. And, and this is the first one that he wrote. And this is a very, very, very famous part of Scripture. In fact, if you've been to a lot of weddings, undoubtedly you've heard part of this. But this is what we're going to look at this morning in 1 Corinthians 13 when we read these words. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have <coughs> not love, I gain nothing. 
you might be the most articulate person ever. You might be the most generous person ever. You might be right in your positions. You may have seen God do some incredible things in you and through you, but Paul tells the, the Corinth church, if you don't have love... If you don't have love, you're just a banging gong, a clanging cymbal. You repel people when there is an absence of love. This is why this is so important. You might be incredibly gifted by God. You may have some of the most incredible gifts and talents available to you. But without love, they're worthless. Without love, they are worthless. Instead of drawing people, they repel people. He says, I could prophesy. I could tell you about the future. I could tell you what's going to happen, what God's going to do. Some of the incredible things that are on their way. But without love, it's worthless. It's nothing. I could literally give away everything I have to the poor. I could be incredibly generous. So much so that people would look at me and they would name building after building after building on college campus, in hospitals, in cities. They would name all kinds of buildings and endowment funds and scholarships after me. They might even make a bronze statue of me somewhere someday that little college kids are going to come by and rub little pennies and nickels on my nose so it glows and birds are going to poop on. But I'm going to be a statue for everybody about how generous I was. But if I don't have love, Love doesn't matter. We're no further ahead. All that is for naught. If I don't have love. Why is it that some of the people who know the most about Scripture are some of the least loving people? You ever notice that? Some of the people who know the most about Scripture become the least loving people. And instead of being known for their love, they're always looking for a fight. They're always looking for a debate. They're always looking to prove other people wrong. They're always looking to prove that they're the smartest person in the room. And somewhere along the way, they've lost sight of the very truth of Scripture. That none of us measure up to God. And all of us need saving by Jesus. But somehow, somewhere along the way, that gets twisted. And the people who know the most and oftentimes love the least. So the question that we have to ask this morning is out of everything that we could be known for, whether it's being incredibly generous, whether it's, it's being people who really love and study God's Word, whether it's, it's being a church that values the, the arts, <laughs> Whatever it is that we could be known for, what are we known for? Because the very thing that we must be known for is to be the most loving people that anyone can encounter. Now we see the traits of love as he continues. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. 
It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I don't know, but maybe we've romanticized this idea of love a little bit. It's easy to do. And I think all of us are guilty of this, at least at one point in our lives or another. For the vast majority of us who find ourselves in relationships, what happens? When you find that special person, you just fall and you fall hard. And it's easy and everything is working smoothly and it's great and you just can't wait to be around the person, and it's, it's awesome. Everything you do is a first, and so there's just a lot of energy, and there's a lot of excitement, and, and things are working really, really well, and it's fun, and it's exciting, and then it gets familiar. <laughs> and then what happens? Well, all of a sudden, all those things that at one time were cute can become a little annoying. And those flaws that you kind of minimized and pushed away a little bit become amplified as you spend more and more time around each other. You start to wonder, why can't you just do this? Or why can't you just do that? Or why can you not ever again remind me of your mother, please? <laughs> These are things that happen into every relationship that you're in as things progress. And at one point in time where something was so meaningful that you would just reach over and hold hands and interlock fingers. Now all of a sudden down the road you're like, yeah, my hand's a little sweaty. Do we really have to hold hands right now? <laughs> and it's not that you don't love each other anymore. I mean, sometimes it is. But other times, it's just, you've moved beyond that stage. See, a lot of problems in relationships, and we're not going to spend a lot of time here today, but a lot of problems in relationships are people don't move beyond that stage. They want everything just to be perfect all the time. And as soon as something happens where it's not easy or perfect, what do they do? They leave. They run away. Like, I'm out of here. It doesn't feel like it used to. Well, of course it doesn't feel like it used to. Because nothing in life stays the same. Everything is progressing or regressing. Nothing in life just stays the same. There is constant movement. And so what happens in our relationships is, is once we get to those hard times, if we're like, oh, what has happened to you? Instead of looking at ourselves as well, then the relationship will stop progressing or end all together. Now here's why this is important. Because love isn't easy. Ask any married couple for more than six months. Love isn't easy. If you made it six months, kudos to you. Because I think Brooke and I may have made it six weeks. <clears throat> love isn't easy. So this is going to be what we're known for here at Lakeside. We just have to be really honest. We just have to be aware. But look at what he says to describe love. That it bears all things. <coughs> it bears all things. That's work. That is hard work to bear all things. To believe all things. Why do you have to believe? Well, because somewhere at some point in time there was, there was just this idea of, I, I don't know, or this is a new concept. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Endures all things. You generally don't talk about endurance when you're going through something that you love. I am a baseball fanatic. On Friday, there was playoff baseball from, from very early in the afternoon until almost midnight. I loved it. 
That was not a test of endurance for me at all. I've gone shopping with my mother for two hours. That is a test of endurance. Why? Because I don't want to be at the store. I don't want to appreciate the things that she appreciates. I mean, they're a waste of money. They're junk. Why would we buy that? If we're worried about somebody knocking it over in the store, why in the world would we buy it and bring it into our home where they would just have to freak out about somebody knocking it over or destroying it there? I mean, outside of a TV, we should have nothing in our homes that we're worried about being knocked over and destroyed. It just doesn't make sense. Now, TV, I'm with you. Kids, get away from the TV. But anything else, that's just poor planning on the parents' part. This is the deal. Love is best. But just because it's best doesn't mean that it's easy. Because it's just the opposite. Love is hard work. And if we're going to be known as the most loving people that people can encounter, as we should be because we're followers of Jesus, that's going to require us to work first on ourselves. Because love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. What love requires in every relationship and amongst all of us collectively as part of Lakeside is to understand that we all have preferences. We all have certain things that we desire, but collectively we have to say, it's not about me. It is not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That is hard work. It takes effort. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part that I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. There's a lot of truth wrapped up in just these verses that we could spend weeks on. And so we're not trying to avoid any of those areas where, where certain people may disagree, but this morning we're just keeping, we're just keeping our mindset on the big idea, and that is, that is this idea of love. Love lasts. Love lasts. And there are Christians who have all kinds of different ideas on, on certain elements that, that he discusses after this, but he says love never ends. As for prophecies they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Love lasts. Why? Why does love last when some of these other elements will pass away? Because God is the very essence of love. <clears throat> God is the very essence of love. And since God is eternal, and He is the very essence of love, then love is eternal. And this idea of, of knowing in part, but, but knowing in full when the perfect comes, when the perfect comes is when Jesus will rule and reign and restore everything to the way it should be. And what will define that? Paul writes this. So now faith, hope, and love Abide. 
these three. But the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. And so at Lakeside, we understand what our job is. And our job is to point people to Jesus. Our job is to realize how changed we've been as a result of a relationship with Jesus individually in our own lives and then collectively rally around that idea and point as many people as possible to the hope that is only available through a relationship with Jesus, a hope that this world so desperately, desperately needs. And so at Lakeside, we're going to love people in the same way that Jesus loves us. We're going to love people in the same way that Jesus loves us. That will be our rallying cry. When we had nothing to offer God, God loved us in spite of that and gave us everything. When nobody else would accept us, <coughs> when nobody else would, would want anything to do with us, God still loved us. And so maybe you're here and you have nobody. Maybe you're here and you feel isolated and you feel alone. And I just want to reach out and tell you, thanks for being here. This is the place for you. And we will strive with everything within us to collectively love you in the same way that Jesus has loved us. So that no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're going through, when you walk through these doors, what you experience more so than anything else is love. Amen. That is our goal. That will be what drives us. So Lakeside, we're going to do some incredible things. <clears throat> there is no question in my mind that we are going to do some incredible things, not because of us, but because of God working through and oftentimes in spite of us. And we are going to do some things that are just exciting, that are done with excellence, that are appealing and engaging. We are going to be encouraged and excited and we are going to move with purpose. We have incredibly gifted people here. But here's our challenge. <laughs> We don't come off. And if we do incredible things, and we provide amazing programs, and we have gifted people, but people look at us and don't see love. We've just become obnoxious. Mm -hmm. And instead of pointing people to Jesus, we'll repel them. So as we wrap up our look at the church, that's our challenge. That when people look at Lakeside, more so than anything else, they would see love. And as we've seen, Jesus, when he first introduced this concept and this idea of the church, 
was talking with his friends, his disciples. And he just told them, Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And as we saw, gates are a defensive mechanism. No army, when they were drafting up their scheme of going into battle, said, let's construct some giant iron gates, and then let's figure out how to carry them on horseback, and let's ride them into a city and hit them with our gates. It doesn't make any sense. Gates are a defensive mechanism. And so as followers of Jesus, what we've been called to do is to go infiltrate this world with a message of hope. The gates of hell will not prevail against this message. And hell has tried. And hell will continue to try. But it has not been successful. And it will not succeed. And so we need to be energized and we need to be excited because we win. We win. Next, we saw that Jesus loves this institution. So much so that he gave down his life for it and established it. So we need to be intentional and we need to be engaged with something that Jesus is passionate about. And then we saw that God has gifted each and every one of us with talents and gifts and abilities. So that not because he needs us, but because he allows us to, we can partner with him in accomplishing his work for his glory. So we're asking you not to sit on the sidelines, but to get invested and to be engaged. And then we saw that everyone matters to God. No one is an interruption. Everyone matters to God. To God, and we are going to reposition ourselves so that we make it clear that we value every single person who walks through those doors because everyone matters to God. And then last week we saw that we need to be devoted, that we need to be invested with our time and our resources and our gifts and in community with one another. And we need to be engaged. And above it all, we need to be known for our love. So Lakeside, let's make sure that the only loud drumming going on is when we sing and not with our lives. Let's make sure that everything we can do individually reflects that love. And if we work on ourselves first, then collectively we'll have no problem. And when people see us, they'll see a difference. That they may not understand at first. But ultimately, they'll see Jesus through us. Which is the entire goal. All of them. God, thank you for Lakeside. Thank you for what you have done in this place. And what you're going to do in this place. Lord, this is yours. It doesn't belong to any of us. It is yours. But as we're here and as we have the opportunity to advance your work here, I pray, God, that we would be intentional about how people see us. That we would be known place that shows people your love. 
that we love others in the same way that you have loved us. Lord, that will not be easy. So help us be patient. Help us be kind. Help us not envy. Help us not boast. Help us not insist on our own way. Help us not be rude. But help us persevere. Help us endure. Help us encourage. Help us hope. Help us have faith. And help us love. So that people see you. In your son, Jesus' name we ask. Amen.